Hello, everybody. Thanks for dropping in whenever you're joining us for this practice. And uh, to the folks that are here on the Zoom, it's so beautiful to see see you and feel your presence, even if your camera is not on, which is totally fine. Um, hmm. <laughs> it's interesting. We were uh, just welcoming folks as they're coming into the Zoom room and, and a, a beautiful big furry head came into the one of the screens, Jazz, uh, so um, which is on point for the Dharma talk tonight. So <laughs> thank you, Jazz. Um, hmm. So I had a wonderful opportunity on, when was it? I'd have to look at my calendar. I think it was, yeah, it was on Saturday. Um, <laughs> to participate in a puppy yoga class. And um, I'm a dog person. Cats are good too. Um, <laughs> let me just uh, mute everybody again. That didn't stick. Okay. And uh, yeah, so <clears throat> it's interesting uh, before I was, um, Dharma teacher, I was a yoga teacher, and for a while, both. Uh, now, now I don't teach yoga. And <laughs> over the years, quite, quite stunned often to see the, the concoctions that we come up with in, in uh, westernized yoga of beer yoga and ganja yoga and naked yoga and goat yoga and I can't even think of all the stuff um and puppy yoga is one of these things that's uh uh not of, not of its origins however uh a great source of joy for me and amazingly, because of the skillful instruction, uh, shout out to uh, Jen Byrne from Awareness Yoga, uh, that it, I did actually do yoga. <laughs> she was very good at guiding us to do is a yoga class with puppies. And so it, it, there was a lot of dharma in it for me, the, the, the way it was guided um gave the opportunity to pay attention to uh several different factors that are part of the dharma and uh so one of the things well i'll just give you a context it was kind of a smallish room it held 11 yogis 11 yoga mats and an instructor and um yeah the mats are pretty close so it wasn't a big room but there uh, so 11 yogis and seven puppies <laughs> so um it just makes me so happy <laughs> it's hard to contain it uh but it was skillfully guided in the beginning you know before the puppies came in we were um you know for mm, grounding and sitting and uh setting intention and establishing presence and and all these things and so in that time it was just watching uh for me the the sensations of uh desire anticipation desire of uh how the mind and the energy would be going forward to wanting the puppies to come in you know and feeling that as a sensation the sensation of wanting of desire and practicing with grounding and present moment and just feeling yeah it was a a, a really helpful mm, several minutes of practice to just watch how much how 
And the desire pulls, can pull us up and out away from present moment awareness into futuring and into wanting and getting and all these things. Uh, so there was um, a lot of, uh, yeah, really helpful information or insights there uh, to feel it as a bodily sensation. So encouragement to look for these opportunities in our daily life. And there's many opportunities. <laughs> uh, to, to when when a thought arises of something you want could be as simple as so oh, I'm gonna go make a cup of whatever your preferred beverage or you're out and see something you want or decide you're gonna go somewhere to get something you want and before just getting just sit and land and feel the, what are the sensations? Where do you feel it? Because those sensations of wanting are having their way with us a lot of the time. They're very powerful energies and they uh, are often mm, running our lives <laughs> like a little puppet on a string almost. And so there's many opportunities to practice with it and notice what is that sensation? And can I just feel that as a sensation for a while and see what happens with it? Uh, and do we fuel it or can we just notice it and stay grounded and present and see it just as a wave arising and passing? Um, yeah, because in that wanting, in that desiring, there's a future, there was in this case anyways, a future anticipating of a future moment. Oh, when they come in, yeah, it's going to be like this. And um, it wasn't yet the case. And so just watching that momentum and that pull and landing, presencing, centering just feeling the sensations that were with that and the thoughts so it was a little little uh desire teaching um and then uh, oh yeah and then uh we the the teacher was again guiding us when the puppies came in to stay sitting with our eyes closed. And that was another, like even another layer of that teaching. Because you can, you can hear them when they come in, their little nails, <laughs> little nails on the floor. And some were kind of whimpering. You could hear the, the uh, breeder, the owner, not owner, breeder, uh, bringing the puppies in. And uh, yeah, so again, it was to just like to to not look, to not reach, to not try to get one of them or something, but just hear the the sounds and watch the thoughts, watch the sensations, and stay present, just resting in that the joy of knowing what the sound was and that they were there and I didn't need to get them. Um, another part of the, the teaching of that puppy yoga experience uh, was, is a practice that we know as mudita. Uh, it's one of the Brahma Viharas, the heart abode practices um, where we feel a harmonic resonance in with the joy that other people are experiencing. So as I mentioned, there's 11 people plus an instructor 
and the breeder and um, another yoga teacher that was there helping out um, and seven puppies. So sometimes like three puppies would be with one person, you know, or they'd be, they're just all over the place. So they might not come to you, but just to practice and really feel the sensations and the uplifting quality, the heart resonance with the joy that others are experiencing. And it's just as joyful as it's different. How is it different? Eh, hard to compare it's apples and oranges. I'm trying to recall the sensation of the mudita, the joy when the puppies were with others and when they were over snuggling uh, with myself. And I almost think I felt more joy seeing other people. It's different. When they were with me, I felt more love. Like I was just like, I love you, I love you. Um, and but with others, I was just like, I'm so happy for you. Like they're just watching their joy and happiness and uh, all, all the whole package that went. Because obviously, people that sign up for this are are people that are wanting that experience. Yeah. So uh, paying attention to to desire, to anticipation, and then to mudita. This uh, resonant quality that is a really really important practice to cultivate it's a formal meditation practice but it's also a heart cultivation that we can practice in daily light daily life and it counters it's a, a this practice counters envy and jealousy or the feeling that there isn't enough, and why do they get that, and why can't I have that? It's a really important part of our practice to feel happiness, resonant happiness in the good fortune and the well-being that other people are experiencing. Hmm. And then another thing I was practicing there in this uh, class, uh, was the intention, the volition. So volition is an important part of the Dharma, uh, meaning um, intention is uh, probably the easiest translation to kind of create what for myself, I was calling it a core memory. I had an intention to remember this sensation, remember this feeling of joy and uh, resonance and um, uplift as a core memory. I'm using that term lightly as most often when it's used, it's referring to like mm, core memories that are created in our formative youthful years. Uh, so I'm not debating that, but my intention was to really pay attention because uh, knowing that we as human creatures have a negativity bias. It's part of our hardwiring that helps us survive, that negative experiences um, actually have a deeper and stronger conditioning effect. They're noticed more and um, not finding the right word. Yeah, negativity bias, it's a thing. <laughs> and so knowing that we need to bring volition, intention, into paying attention when joyful things are happening. 
not in a way of spiritual bypassing uh, what is painful and we got lots of that to practice with. Um, and it is considered a uh, skillful and a part of wise effort that when wholesome, skillful, onward leading conditions are present uh, to cultivate those and stabilize them. Yeah, so uh, it, it's not about clinging to it, mm -hmm. but just really noticing what the sensation was and how um, all the sense doors, the sounds, the, the touch, the felt experience in the body, etc. And this is related to many aspects, really, of Dharma. But um, one of them is what's called Sankaras. And it's a very difficult thing to translate or describe. And in the Pali English Dictionary, it actually has like a paragraph on that saying, yeah, we don't have a thing for it. it it's all these things. And so, uh, uh, which parts to share? <clears throat> so, Sankara, partially, means that all things are put together or have come together by other pre made, pre existing conditions. Everything. Uh, is formed or made, created by many other formations. It's related to karma as well. <clears throat> and an important part of Sankara's is volition. As I was mentioning already, volition is a part of what is put together or composed. And so sankharas are both karmic, vast and infinite conditions coming together and creating constant arising and passings of other conditioned things, including this self. And part of that um future conditioning is volition what intention what awareness is brought in present moment all things all conditioned coming togethers are conditioned and impermanent arising and passing. And uh, how we relate to everything in its arising and passing conditions future moments. And this is something that is going is continuing and is going to continue until one reaches nibbana or nirvana, which means the unconditioned. One aspect of nibbana is the unconditioned, that things are no longer conditioned when one is a not even one, when full awakening or enlightenment uh happens. <clears throat> so it is part of this human experience and this conditioned world. Part of this volition, as I mentioned, was is a mudita, that pres the practice of resonant, harmonic, interrelated joy 
And some of the definitions of mudita that I was uh, looking up today in the Pali English Dictionary uh, are soft-heartedness. When we are uh, practicing in this way of uh, feeling the sensations of joy and the well-being um, that others are experiencing, it softens our heart. Mm. Counters self-contraction. Uh, another part of the definition of mudita is with gladdened heart. Um, and and uh, another is pleased in mind. I like that. Pleased in mind. Pleased. I'm very pleased. It's a word we don't, I don't say too often. Pleased. I'm very pleased. It's nice. It's, it has such a softness to it, you know? Not just like, I'm happy or I've got what I want, but pleased in mind. It uh, feels very gentle to me. In, uh, in mind, uh, this is uh, likely their meaning citta, heart mind, the uh, aware heart. Yeah, so um, you've probably often heard the phrase, we're always practicing something. You know, so to uh, pay attention to what am I practicing? Am I practicing fear? Am I practicing hmm, self-hatred? Am I practicing whatever? We could, you you can fill in the blank. What am I practicing? We're always practicing something. You know, and so that's why part of my intention around that kind of pausing near the end of that class to be like making that kind of core memory as I was calling it for myself of like, yeah, what am I practicing? And this is something I really want to be able to recall the sensation and um, this feeling in the heart, body, mind. And, uh, you know, so some of the questions around what am I practicing or what sankharas am I conditioning? What future volitions, volitional formations am I uh, conditioning? It is like, what am I attending to? What am I mm, filling my awareness with? Is it balanced? Uh, what activities am I engaged in? Who am I spending time with? These things all have an effect and um, condition future arisings. Hmm. I think that's it. Yeah. So these are some of the 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 uh, aspects of the Dharma that showed up for me in this this class that um, if you don't have an opportunity to experience a puppy yoga, puppy yoga class, which of course they they don't come around, uh, there's so many ways. Uh, before we came on the call, uh, some of us were talking about the uh, the rare uh, rare is not quite right the um, limited exposure to the sun that some of us have had lately, <laughs> and and the sun's been out the last few days, and so taking the opportunity to stop or to get outside or even to get at a window. I find myself sometimes at the kitchen window, just, oh, just letting it um, be known. And uh, yeah, so it doesn't need to be puppies. It could be, uh, yeah, 
especially for some folks here who are probably, um, you know, are allergic to dogs. It's probably not a great example for you. Um, but so many ways, just turning to the sun and really feeling it and feeling that light and the energy and the brightness. How does it feel in the body? What does it do to, to the whole life experience that's being known in that moment? Um, hmm. There was also the sound of birds recently uh, when the sun was out um, where where I am. Uh, there's it, there's opportunities all day long, and some we need to often turn towards them. Have some because we do have um, our intention and volition is part of sankaras. So let's practice with this uh, as part of our what what we're cultivating tonight. So to uh, adjust anything in your environment, if you want to turn your change your lighting, your your posture, get any supports you need, you might like to turn away from the computer. If you want to move to a more comfortable seat or to lay down, whatever you whatever you need. I was thinking today also, you know, there's there's like cat people and dog people, and I was thinking about like a cat yoga or kitten yoga class. <laughs> well, that would be different. Their sharp little nails, <laughs> but also sweet furry beings. Mm. All right, so once you've adjusted your environment, your posture, your supports, take some time before you um, kind of uh, don't, don't need to rush yourself into stillness. You might need some movement or stretch. Depending on how your being is in this moment, some sighing breaths might be helpful. So that you take your time to really let your body, your nervous system come into a place where it feels ready to rest in a wakeful, upright, and restful posture. And when you feel ready, find a place for the eyes to come to rest. It might be closed or downward or resting on a, an object of beauty in your space. Something that's calming and restful. And as the eyes come to rest, begin to feel any gathered tensions or contractions in the muscles of the face that might appreciate some 
softness or ease or space. And as the face relaxes a bit or more, feel that all the way around the skull and then down the neck. Neck and throat. Relaxing. As the muscles of the Neck lengthen the shoulders, slide down away from the earlobes, not by pulling down, but by relaxing. Let the bones drop. Down through heavy elbows into relaxed hands. And then noticing any tension across the shoulders or chest. Sometimes a few slightly deeper breaths can help this bring a bit of movement into what might feel stiff or tense. And feeling into the areas of the middle and lower back and belly. Letting the bones rest and the muscles let go a little bit or more. Feeling the weight of the hips, pelvis. And the relaxed and grounded legs and feet. If you're practicing laying down, you might feel this all the way through the back of the body, grounded. And seeing already that We've been practicing with volition and sankharas just in this arriving and grounding, relaxing part of the practice. We have all arrived here through infinite conditions showing up with busy mind or heartache or physical pain or intention. So many things. And then we're bringing our intention into softening and landing and grounding.
And then we'll all share another minute or so with this in silence, just allowing yourself to fully show up so that your whole energy, body, awareness catches up with you and lands here in the center of awareness. And now bringing into awareness an invitation to recall what may be some version of a core memory for you, a time of soft heartedness, of joy, of gladness, being pleased in heart mind. It may be a very simple moment of turning your face to the sun or of a, anything. Could be a long time ago or recent time of joy, connection, laughter, ease. And then invite in as much of that memory as is available. As you recall, how did that feel in the body? What sounds, what sights, sensations, touch, taste? How how was the uplifting of the mind experienced? How did it feel in the mind? And then letting go of that recollection and feeling the sensations of the body connected with ground, softening any tension. Feeling whatever present moment touch points are helpful for you.
And then now inviting in the awareness of someone that you know, hopefully directly, if you can't think of someone that you know directly, it could be um, by extension, uh, someone that is experiencing joy recently, something good fortune has happened or um, some happiness, some well-being. Mm. And whatever you know about that situation, that experience that they've had, again, it could be something very simple. And feel how that is in your heart-mind awareness. When you feel that sense of connection with them, the gladdening of the mind, gladdening of the heart, feeling pleased in mind for them, soft-heartedness, And in these next few minutes together in the silence, you can just rest in that as a sensation in body, heart, mind. Or you might like to add the mudita bhavana phrases. May your good fortune continue. May this happiness expand for you. May your well-being grow. May this goodness become stable for you. And then from here, we'll bring these qualities of enlightening, upliftment, ease, joy to rest with our anchor now. You might choose the breath as your anchor. If breath doesn't work for you, perhaps the sensation of your hands. And bring these qualities to that anchor as you just simply rest and feel some ease and uplift, uplifting energy with that anchor.
As we move towards closing this practice, if you like, in awareness, extending awareness to each other here, sharing practice, those who are joining us in practice later with the recording. And if you're, uh, if it feels resonant for you, all beings, may all beings have joy touch their lives. May all beings have the causes and conditions to experience gladdening of the heart, mind. May all beings everywhere be free of dukkha. And I wanted to remind and mention that joy is um, one of the seven factors of awakening. It's a little different than mudita, which is that resonant joy and the joy that others are experiencing. But uh, by the end of that practice, after we practice, Cultivating joy. Notice if it felt any mm, easier isn't the right word that I want to use, but it's what's coming to mind. Any uh, more accessible to rest with your anchor. Uh, so if you chose the breath, like uh, for those last several minutes of practice. Oh, did it feel more accessible to rest with the breath after practicing 20 minutes of cultivating joy? Uh, so often we can get into, um, and if it works for you, that's cool. Not, not a problem. Uh, but we can get a bit too much like the breath is the thing and I'm going to get on it and I'm going to, I'm going to get on it. Uh, and uh, it may be skillful to recall the seven factors of awakening which uh, we've we've covered in many of the previous recordings but uh, includes mindfulness and curiosity which bring energy which then becomes joyful uplifting and this continues to level off into calm and then concentration and equanimity. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it might be uh, a helpful part to include in your practice at times. And I also just wanted to mention that uh, uh, another thing I noticed uh, in that experience of puppy yoga was that there wasn't uh, any clinging at the end of the class because because of, uh, there was a lot of a, a lot of a fair amount of presence in the joy as it was happening and uh, just that full experience of of that moment that when it was over it was like great. <laughs> If they'd invited me to stay, if you're right, I would have stayed. But with it being over, it was like, oh, lovely. That was lovely. Lovely. And uh, yeah, so that was interesting to to notice that it, um, 
it wasn't a, a clinging with it. Hmm. Okay, I think that's all the bits. Um, I hope you find something fruitful for your practice to turn towards and cultivate uh, this skillful aspect of uh, awareness, awake awareness. Thanks for joining us.